Saturday, July 11th in 1863 started a normal day on the mostly dirt streets of the small southwestern Indiana community known as Francisco. By the end of the day, it would be anything but normal. This is the story of a small southwestern Indiana town and its involvement in the American Civil War and the events leading up to the killing of a Confederate spy in the middle of Main Street. This community was just finding its way. Only 12 years had passed since it was platted and laid out by John Perkins in 1851. The area got its name from a Spanish laborer who had built its first small shack on the banks of the Wabash Erie Canal. From that first shack, a town had grown very fast. In the shops around town, you could find a shave for six cents. Haircuts were 12. Milk could be purchased for 32 cents a gallon, and you could find a gallon of whiskey for $3.50. Businessmen from all over Gibson County had been moving their homes to the town, setting up grain mills, hotels, shipping facilities all along the banks. Like our neighbors to the south Evansville on the Ohio River, Francisco had become a place products could reach the entire country and even the world by shipping goods north and south. In 1861, at the beginning of the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln requested Indiana muster 7,500 men to fight with the Union Army. Within just two weeks, 22,000 men had volunteered, while even more had to be turned away. By 1863, the Civil War had been raging across the South for some time. However, for maybe the first time, war would threaten those back here in Francisco as well. The battle between the North and the South was getting closer than ever before to the quiet dirt streets in eastern Gibson County. Before this day would end, Union soldiers would be rushed out of town to a nearby Evansville post, and at least one soldier would be buried in the cemetery that overlooked the community. In order to understand the fear people felt back here in Francisco, it is important to understand what was going on all across America during the Civil War, and especially the guerrilla-style fighting taking place in the state of Kentucky. July 7, 1863. Just a few days had passed since the Battle of Gettysburg. More than 8,000 men lost their lives in just three days of battle. Back here in Francisco, news had been pouring into town that Confederate Brigadier General John Hunt Morgan and his men, a large group of mounted cavalrymen fighting for the South, were nearing the Ohio River in Kentucky. Many here feared they would soon cross the river in Indiana from the South and bring with them the ugly tragedies of the Civil War. Morgan had made it clear he was determined to bring the terrors of war to Indiana, although doing so was against the orders of his command. Many of Francisco's men had joined Union forces and were off fighting the war in the South, some as young as 13 years old. Among the Francisco men who would serve, an area farmer, Thomas Jefferson Williams, served in the Union Army alongside 40 of his cousins and family members from all across Gibson and Vandenberg counties. Thomas, a long way from Francisco, would find himself in battle at Franklin, Tennessee, Big Shanty, the fall of Atlanta, and even Sherman's march to the sea. Gibson County alone would send 2,100 men to fight for the Union Army. Of the men who remained in town, some were known as Southern Sympathizers, or Copperheads, members of the Knights of the Golden Circle. This didn't set well with the women who had family off fighting in the South, some of which would never return to the community along the banks of the Erie Canal. Now let's go back one more year to 1862 and the attack on Henderson. In 1862, Kentucky remained uncommitted to the North or the South. The state and the city of Henderson had a lot at stake given the dependence of slaves to work the tobacco farms. President Lincoln would get only seven votes from Henderson County, yet the population remained somewhat friendly to Union forces, which would occupy the city for much of 1862. The Union Army had several hundred men staying 
at the National Hotel in downtown Henderson. On June 29th, Adam Johnson and only three or four Confederate guerrilla soldiers would launch an attack on the National Hotel that killed a Union officer and a few other men. Aided by darkness, Johnson and his men, armed each with three or four weapons, would fire at unsuspecting soldiers relaxing on the front steps of the hotel. Johnson's men fired everything they had, and when they emptied their weapons, they quickly moved to the rear of the hotel. After reloading, they would fire every round from various weapons and slip off into the darkness. The Union was under the impression they were being attacked by 50 to 100 men, and in the days following, the stories as they spread across America would swell the number of attackers to a few hundred. Adam Johnson's attack was a success for him and for the South. While this savage attack was underway in downtown Henderson, the wife and children of famed Union Army General Ulysses S. Grant were sleeping just across the Ohio River at the American House Hotel in downtown Evansville. Grant's wife and four children were headed to visit the general in Memphis aboard the Sternwheeler, the John T. McCombs, and had stopped off for the night in Evansville. Luckily, Colonel Johnson did not know this, or his focus could have well been on the American Hotel in Evansville instead of the National Hotel, separated only by the waters of the Ohio River. Many back in Francisco and all across Indiana were grateful that the Ohio River was acting as a boundary from the warfare in the South, and at least up to this point, separated Indiana from the guerrilla-style fighting in Kentucky. In just a few days, this comfort would come to an end. One year prior to the fear that Morgan would cross the Ohio River with his 2,500-man cavalry, the Confederate Army crossed into the North for the first time in 1862. Colonel Adam Rankin Johnson, on the heel of his success in Henderson, had now captured the town of Newburgh. On July 18th of 1862, with a group of only 35 men and two cannons, Colonel Johnson rallied men from nearby Henderson, Kentucky, to join him in his raid. Johnson sent two men in advance of a larger group to take up a position on a hill that overlooked the town. They had fashioned two old Quaker guns out of stovepipe and some wagon wheels. Painted to look like real cannons, the two men waited until the rest swept into town. The Union Army at the time maintained a hospital in Newburgh at the Exchange Hotel. This was for soldiers wounded while fighting in the South. This group of soldiers were far from a combat force, and many were still recovering from wounds they suffered during battle. It took only a few minutes for Johnson and his men to receive a surrender from the ranking Union officer. Johnson gave him a pair of binoculars, and when he viewed the two cannons on the hill, Colonel Johnson assured him he would shell the entire town to the ground if the Union were to put up a fight. Johnson's men looted the town for cash, guns, food, and supplies to return to the South. The men made off with 200 pistol and holster sets, as well as 75 sabers. Many businesses and private homes were looted by this band of guerrilla Confederate soldiers. When word spread in the South of this bloodless battle in Newburgh, Colonel Johnson would for the remainder of the war be known as Stovepipe Johnson. Although no blood was spilled in this raid, it marked the first time Confederate soldiers had ventured across the Ohio River and into Northern Territory. News of this raid would have been received back in Francisco within a day or two, and given that Francisco was merely a short ride up the towpath from Newburgh, it was sure to spark fear in the community. Although no men were killed by the attacking army, in the days following the Newburgh raid, a handful of lives would be lost. When Union volunteers and regulars responded to the Confederate invasion, they would quickly execute a handful of locals who were, who were seen assisting the South in the attack and looting. News of the Newburgh raid and the aftermath would rattle the entire state of Indiana, 
Camp Gibson in Princeton, numbers would quickly grow from 300 to over 1,000 men ready to defend Indiana soil. After the success in Henderson and now Newburgh, Adam Johnson found the recruiting of men to fight along his side would get much easier. His numbers were growing when he would again ride into Henderson and take that city completely over. The Union had removed its soldiers and others had fled the city for safety on Indiana soil. Johnson's taking of Henderson would be short-lived, however. As word spread up and down the Ohio, and with river traffic coming to a halt, the Union gunship Brilliant was about to take back Henderson. Not one man in Henderson would be meeted, needed to drive out Johnson and his rebels. 25-year-old Lieutenant Commander Charles G. Perkins and his 155-foot U.S. gunboat would restore order in Henderson after swearing he would shell the town all night with cannons aboard the Brilliant. Can you imagine the sound of Union cannons firing a warning from the waters of the Ohio into downtown Henderson? Johnson and his men would flee the city, making off with more loot and weapons. In spite of Johnson's relatively easy eviction from Henderson, his popularity would continue to grow across the South. Francisco kept up with the war news by sending someone daily to Princeton to gather all the news they could and return it to the streets or to the home of one of the locals. Getting the news daily instead of bi-weekly mail delivery was very important during the war. The cost of sending this man was met by groups formed to raise the money. If last minute and many times somber but important news came in, the church bells would ring through the streets. Everyone hearing the bells would gather around the steps of the church, waiting for what was more than likely bad news for someone in the crowd. On this warm July day, the townspeople were finding out that Morgan and his cavalry had now crossed the Ohio River, leaving a burnt and bloody trail as they tra traveled north towards Corden. The reality that war was getting closer and closer every day to the streets of Francisco was not setting well with the residents. Residents knew from news reports that if Morgan and his men were to make it to their town, this would surely bring with it at least destruction and at the worst, death. Morgan had made it very clear he intended to bring the tragedies of this bloody war to the streets of southern Indiana on his way north. A man named Warrell had wandered into Francisco in late May to early June of 1863, and the folks around town feared he was a southern spy. As time passed, not much information on this man could be obtained, and concerns grew as to why this man was here. No one knew for sure what part of the country Warrell was from, and exactly what had brought him to this community. Concerns grew even more when he would be seen with the Knights of the Golden Circle. This group consisted of mainly the few young men who remained in Francisco during the war, some possibly southern sympathizers. When seen with an unknown outsider, it could only fuel the concerns of locals. In late June of 1863, it was becoming well known that Confederate Brigadier General Morgan was sending spies into the North in an attempt to find out if men of Indiana would be favorable and possibly even fight alongside Morgan and his men when they entered Indiana from the South. In addition to Francisco possibly having a spy from the South in its midst, it would soon be revealed that Morgan had spies in several Southern Indiana towns. These men were led by Thomas Hines, and would lay the groundwork for Morgan's cavalry. The operation would become known as the Heinz Raid. Two spies who had been in Cordon for a few months would join the cavalry when the attack was launched on that town. A few more were chased back across the river when they were discovered to be Confederate soldiers in Indiana in the towns of Paoli and French Lick. Southern sympathizer groups in Indiana like the Knights of the Golden Circle in Francisco, made it clear to Hines that they would not be favorable 
of Morgan and his cavalry bringing troops into Indiana. On this day in July, many around town must have been at least somewhat relieved to hear the day's good news that Morgan and his men were traveling straight north from Corden towards Salem, Indiana. Knowing every minute should the direction change, it could e easily bring them right to the community of Francisco. Given trade along and on the Wabash Erie Canal at the time, Francisco feared they were a target if the men were to shift towards the west after leaving Corden. The Confederate Army likely assumed that everything from guns to supplies for Union soldiers were being shipped south via the canal. Behind Morgan and his men in Corden were left the ruins of many burnt-out buildings and railroad bridges. The bodies of Union soldiers and a few Indiana militia who had been thrown together from the remaining men of towns across far south-central Indiana were left to the locals to give a proper burial. Also among the ruins and in the wake of the cavalry crossing the Ohio River were sunken boats and one dead toll worker of the boats and barges which had brought Morgan and his men across the Ohio River. A Lutheran minister had even been killed outside Corden and his son injured during the battle. This kind of news concerned the residents of Francisco, who knew if the cavalry ever reached their small town, mills and bridges along the canal would more than likely not survive the invasion. News reached Francisco on this 10th day of July of 1863 that Morgan and his bloody cavalry had turned east from Salem and were heading to the towns in eastern Indiana of Vernon, DuPont, and Versailles. It was looking like Francisco would be clear from the looting and danger. Morgan's own men would danger him greatly in Versailles when they looted the local Masonic Lodge and took the group's silver coin jewelry. Morgan ordered the loot returned and punished his men, perhaps in part because he himself was a Mason. Francisco had to be relieved that actions such as these had at least for now avoided the quiet dirt streets along the banks of the canal. Thousands of soldiers from all over Indiana had already given their lives in the war between the North and the South. The state of Indiana had men fight in every single battle that took place during the war. Most families had at least one male serving in the war, and many around Gibson County had as many as two family members fighting. The Hoosier State would bury nearly 25,000 soldiers and see another 50,000 wounded. 205,000 men would serve the Union Army, while as many as a few thousand joined forces in the South and fought for the Confederacy. On the afternoon of July 11th, folks from all over town and the nearby countryside had gathered on Main Street to welcome home a handful of Francisco boys back on furlough from fighting in the South. Joining the Francisco soldiers were a few soldiers from far southern Indiana who had joined the Francisco boys while fighting in Tennessee. Fear of Morgan and his men still lingered on this Saturday in mid-July. The soldiers' arrival home was a very welcome sight. With the crowd growing and the day growing to a close, the stranger known only as Warrell would find his way up Main Street. In just a few seconds, the joyous day of socializing with the men would turn tragic. Someone in the crowd mentioned to the Union soldiers that the man making his way up Main Street was suspected to be a Southern spy. One of the men drew his weapon, and with one shot, Orell would lay dead in the middle of Main Street. For the first time, blood from this ugly war would flow into the dirt streets of Francisco. Other than the mostly peaceful raid on Newburgh, and the bloody raid on Corden, the killing of Warrell may have well been the only other fatal blow delivered to the Confederate Army on Indiana soil. Being no one knew for sure if this unknown man was indeed a Southern spy, 
Later that night, soldiers were rushed out of town to a nearby Evansville post, and the body of the unknown man would be buried in the hillside cemetery overlooking the community.